Welcome everyone to today's webinar on Fast Train Fever. I'm Kat Clay, the Head of Digital Communications at the Grattan Institute, and I'm also a self-confessed train tragic. So I've taken many train journeys across the world, but the most memorable for me was certainly traveling across Transylvania in winter on a very slow train. So slow, in fact, that the horse and cart going through the snow next to the train was going faster than the train itself. So today we're examining whether Australia should dump the dream of building a bullet train from Brisbane to Melbourne, and if we should focus on regional rail renovations instead. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands on which we meet today, wherever we are in Australia watching this webinar. I would also like to pay my respects to Elders past, present and future, and any Aboriginal people watching here today. Thank you for coming. So here to talk all things trains today, we have Marion Terrell, Grattan's Transport and Cities Program Director, and Gabriel Metcalf, the CEO for the Committee of, for Sydney, in what is sure to be a lively conversation. So I'll just go through a little bit of what's going to happen today, and then we'll get right into it. So first up, we'll have Marion and Gabriel do presentations for us for about 10 minutes each. And then we're going to get into some um, questions, digging into a bit more of the detail of their proposals and research. And then after that, we've got a time for question and answer. So if you have a question during the webinar today, please um, pop it in the Q&A tool on the sidebar and we'll try to get to those questions. We've already got some great ones from pre-submitted from the audience when you registered. So without further ado, I'll just hand it over to you, Marion. So thanks very much, Kat, and thank you everyone for joining us here today. Kat, I'm pretty confident that you're not the only person here who loves trains, especially fast trains, although yours is a slow train story. But I love trains too. One of my favourite train memories is taking the TGV from Paris to Bordeaux. Sort of remember the view out the window and how reasonably priced it was, and even the snacks were very good. I, and, and perhaps if we ever get to a point where international travel is on the agenda again, I hope to go on the Shinkansen one day. Before COVID struck, fast rail was firmly back on the public agenda. Both the major parties had been advocating their own particular vision for, um, for rail upgrades at both Commonwealth and state level. And both Gabriel through the Committee for Sydney and I have publish reports on fast trains. And we'll talk about them over those different perspectives over the course of this webinar. But I wanted just to say up front, um, I went into this whole question of fast trains with an open mind. At the start, my co-authors and I did not know where we would land. We just went looking for evidence. The other point I wanted to make before I launch into this is just a bit about terminology. I think the, the, the language the train speeds can be confusing. People talk about high speed, fast, faster, and very fast. And which of those is the fastest? They can be used a bit interchangeably. They're just a set of, there's no, they're not technical definitions. So what we've done, and I'll show you a slide on this. So I'll start to share some slides with you, but we've classified them. Um, we've been Grattan by the speed that they're intended to achieve. And, um, the first, let me just uh, bring this up. So the first um, of these is, uh, hold on, sorry. Uh, <laughs> the first is bullet trains. We call them bullet trains. These are trains that go 250 kilometres per hour or more. They're running mostly or entirely on new tracks. And they're like what people think about with, France's TGV or the Eurostar or Japan's Shinkansen. The other category is expanding existing lines to enable speeds of 150 to 200 kilometres an hour. And that's by things like electrifying the line, uh, removing bends, flattening inclines, and we call them rail renovations. So it's the rail renovation proposals that are being developed right now. This slide shows you um, that it, it's a set of proposals for linking that link regional cities and towns to their state capital. 
And the headline objectives of this are to boost major regional centres and to take pressure off our largest cities. But high-speed rail or bullet trains aren't dead yet. Not only does the idea come up every 10 years or so, but, the, but Federal Labor took a proposal to the last election, and I'll show you what their proposal was, um, for a new high-speed rail between Melbourne, Sydney and Brisbane, stopping at major cities and towns along the way. The entire line would take almost 50 years to complete and it would come into operation in stages. So that's what we're talking about here. I'm going to give you a very quick overview of my perspective on both types of proposal, and then I'll look forward to exploring it more in the Q&A. So I'll start with bullet trains. So what is wrong with bullet trains? So obviously nothing is wrong with them. They're great. The question about bullet trains, I think, is at what cost? And I'll show you a few slides to make this point. So firstly, um, on, the, on the literal cost to build it, Back in 2013, the estimate was for $130 billion, $130 billion in today's, uh, in today's dollars. So it is true that very large sums of public money seem to be a lot more commonplace these days than they used to, but this is a truly massive sum. It's the cost of the job keeper allowance, which people keep calling unprecedented, um, or, as this slide shows you, you could have the equivalent of 20 large transport infrastructure projects for that kind of money. 20 large projects, not just on the Eastern seaboard, but all over the country, and addressing not just intercity links, but a variety of transport needs. So that's fine, like it is a lot of money, but it doesn't mean that it's not worth it. I, I think the question then is how effective would it be? And I just want to show you one of the things that we found very persuasive in doing and preparing this report was to look at countries that do have high speed rail links and to look at, at how similar and different we are. What we found is that relative to countries that already have bullet trains, Australia's population is too small and too spread out. So you can see Melbourne, Sydney, Brisbane down there in the red font. Um, and, and you could, so basically it's a combination of the distance and the population size in the centres. This matters because in general, the more people that use the train, the higher the benefits and the shorter the distances cover, the less it costs to build and maintain. Even if you just built Melbourne to Sydney, it would be the second longest stretch of fast rail between any two cities in the world with a population of over a million. The third thing I wanted to comment on was the emissions. People have been very supportive of bullet trains because of the contribution they could make to reducing our emissions. And, and I think this is absolutely right. A trip by bullet train would cause fewer emissions than a plane trip. And, and it's important because all states and territories have committed to reaching net zero emissions by 2050. And transport is, is, sort of doesn't have a lot planned for it. But you need to think not just about the train when it's up and running, but also the construction phase. And this slide is showing you that. So the, from the time that you make the decision to build, to complete the whole line would take almost 50 years. It, it would come online in stages, but um, you can see that it, um, it takes 30 odd years um, before you get any net reduction. It, it, Essentially, you've got the construction of this um, involves a lot of concrete and steel, very emissions intensive, and it would cause emissions to be higher than they otherwise would have been for well over 20 years. And this is right in the period when we are trying to get net emissions down to zero. So unfortunately, it would hinder rather than help that goal. Um, we may talk more about this in the Q&A on bullet trains, but I, I just want to move on to regional rail upgrades or rail renovations as we called them. Um, th this is the, uh, um, these, are, these are quite varied. There, there's a lot of different types of proposals on, on the table, and they're mostly at the point where business cases are being developed. Um, for the majority of them, the Commonwealth is, is working with the relevant state government on this. So I don't want to second guess what the business cases will conclude. I think the key point I'll make for now is about the potential for regional rail 
upgrades to take pressure off cities. Um, so this has been a stated goal of the regional rail upgrades. And, and the view that I have come to is that they are, they're just too small to make any inroads into pressures like crowding and congestion. So the idea behind this is that people would move out of Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane and they live in Wollongong or Geelong or the Gold Coast, but they would keep their city job because they could commute on a quicker, a, a more realistic train ride. So not every city not with an upgrade is in this category, but for those regional cities where the train trip would be sort of feasibly fast enough, most people who commute from those regional cities drive today. So let me show you that. Um, and we might particularly focus on Wollongong because we're lucky enough to have Gabriel here from the Committee for Sydney. But what, what you can see here with Wollongong is um, almost everybody drives. The only people who essentially who take public transport from Wollongong to Sydney are people who work in the inner city. And it's the same story for Melbourne and for Brisbane. And it, this, and it makes sense if you think about the fact that people do work all over the city. They work in very dispersed workplaces. Most jobs are not in the CBD. 15% of Sydney's jobs are in the CBD. And a lot of people get free parking where they get to work. So it's quite a um, driving um, does retain a strong pull factor for people who don't work in the CBD. CBD is a different story. Um, the people who do take public transport to the CBD, um, so the number of, of those people who go from Wollongong to Sydney and they take public transport and they work in the CBD, there's 3,200 of them. So that's really the group that you're trying to increase. And, and what I'd say about this is, imagine you doubled that number, um, which is, you know, perhaps it's realistic, perhaps it's ambitious, but imagine you double that with people moving out of Sydney, moving to Wollongong, but keeping their city job. So it's great. And those people definitely benefit without a doubt, but it's less than 4% of one year's population growth for Sydney or in normal times, at least. So it's a similar story in Melbourne and Brisbane. I think in other words, this is just too small to make a difference on it. So you'd need a lot of other strategies to go with it. So I've talked to you about bullet trains and I've talked a bit about rail renovations. I'm gonna pause here and hand back to Kat and I'll look forward to exploring some of these issues in more detail in the discussion. Thanks so much, Marion. And um, I do appreciate some of the, the feedback from people that when you release this report was, yes, but we love bullet trains. <laughs> um, mm. And I'm really keen to hear your thoughts, Gabriel, um, on high-speed rail. Okay, well, thank you um, very much. Um, and uh, I will call up my screen as well. Um, Kat, can you see that? Is it? All right. So um, uh, I agree with so much of what uh, Marion said, and I, I, follow, I follow her work and really everything Grattan does quite closely. Um, but my job today is to provide um, another perspective, so I will. Fast train fever isn't so bad. Um, why renovated rail might work, but bullet trains won't, except under certain circumstances. Um, I'm going to make, in a sense, a, an, an ambivalent um, pitch for, for not being quite as negative about, about some of these ideas. Um, so I run the Committee for Sydney um, today. That is a role I've been in for um, a year and a half. Um, before that, I was um, in a similar role in San Francisco. I was running a, a urban policy think tank um, for many, many years. And I was a protagonist in a quite parallel debate um, about uh, high-speed rail in California. Uh, as well as metropolitan rail uh, in, in uh, Northern California. Um, I, I think that it actually makes a lot of sense to look to uh, the United States and Canada for some of these debates um, for some of the reasons maybe implied by Marion, but, but, but fundamentally the land use pattern in these, in these countries tends to be different from the places that have successful high-speed rail systems. Um, so much of the so much of the uh, 
urban fabric was built after World War II in the age of the automobile. Um, and so I think actually um, we can learn a lot from looking at some of the high-speed rail um, debates in North America. Although keep in mind that um, America has a struggle with government competence. Uh, as you're all watching these days uh, on public health. And so you can't really learn that much from the execution capacity of, of American states when it comes to high-speed rail, but you, you can learn something from the, the, the kind of land use transport um, debates that happen, perhaps. Um, so uh, I think my overall um, starting place for this is that, um, uh, the land, the, the right reason to make some of these rail investments is because you think it might help you change land use. Um, we have inherited both in the US and in Australia, a very inefficient land use pattern that um, forces the vast majority of trips um, uh, into cars. And we've uh, entered the Anthropocene when that is no longer a morally acceptable outcome, it's probably not an economically acceptable outcome either. Um, and so the question I think we wanna be asking is how effective will some of these investments be as, at uh, stimulating a, move, a, a transformation of land use over time to a more compact model? Um, so let me start with a few quibbles. Um, I think Melbourne to Brisbane is too far, but if we use Melbourne to Sydney, it is a, it's a, that's putting a better face on the argument. Um, uh, and in fact, it's, it's a bit analogous in distance to um, Madrid to Barcelona or Los Angeles to San Francisco. Um, so that might be my first quibble. Let's, let's take Brisbane out of the equation, even though of course it's part of the it's part of the ALP's vision. Um, second quibble, um, the population growth numbers um, should probably be higher um, because Australia's rate of population growth is higher than, um, than the other uh, cities that we're really comparing to here that have, or, I mean, the other countries that have um, high-speed rail systems. Um, this has been true for quite a long time. Now, yes, there is a lot of uncertainty in the immediate future about how that changes as a result of COVID, but um, I think it's probably going to be true that um, 10 years from now, Australia, again, will have a higher rate of population growth um, than the UK, the US, Japan, China, Germany, or France, or Spain, or Italy. Um, the only country that is going to be close is Canada in terms of the rate of population growth. And Canada's cities are actually a lot farther apart than Sydney and Melbourne for the most part. So um, there is a, it's reasonable to use a future population growth number for thinking about whether these investments make sense in a way that is not true in other countries. Um, trying to advance, there we go. Uh, and here you, can, here you can see, we just took the official 2050 projections um, for Melbourne, Canberra, and Sydney, and, and compared that to um, the Madrid to Barcelona or, or the um, Italian um, case studies, just taking numbers from, from Marion's report. So if you put those together, if you, if you just made it be Melbourne to Sydney with a, with a higher number, the, the high-speed rail, proposal would be more in line with this distance versus population graph. Um, on the topic of climate change, um, I think I would interpret Marion's graph a bit differently that after 30 years, you start to get deep decarbonization benefits at a time when you're really gonna want them. And if you don't burn the carbon now, you're gonna have to burn it then um, to get those benefits. So it's probably, you could interpret it the other way and conclude it's, it's logical to just go ahead and start getting those benefits as soon as possible rather than forestall that 30 more years. Um, 
aviation is today a relatively small share of Australia's GHGs, relatively small share of global GHGs. However, it is projected to rise. Uh, the best number I could find is people think it will rise to become 25% of global GHGs um, because current policies and current technologies um, are going to reduce carbon from so many other sectors, but aviation remains a huge problem. So to say that the Sydney to Melbourne um, linkage is well served by aviation is not the end of the story. It is actually a problem that needs solving. We will uh, either be reducing the, the spatial interaction between those two cities um, because people will use Zoom meetings um, and whatever future versions of that get invented, or we're gonna have to decarbonize that interaction. And, and it just is not going to be okay to have the current level of aviation into the future. Um, I guess the final thing I'll say about um, the, the high-speed rail part of this conversation um, is that I think we need, we need a theory about what we're trying to accomplish by facilitating interaction at this scale. Um, so I just made up this little chart as a, as a structure to think about it, that um, at the scale of the precinct, um, uh, where people, people are obsessed with this notion of innovation precincts, we're obsessed with it. Um, and that's really a theory that um, easy access by foot, that, that scale of interaction does something for the economy, for innovation. Um, the metropolitan area is the scale of the labor market. That's where you can have a daily commute. And certainly economic theory um, says that's the most important scale for interaction. Um, Silicon Valley is not a precinct, it's a metropolitan area. Um, uh, Hollywood is not a precinct, it's a metropolitan area, um, um, you know, et cetera. Um, these, the, the clusters that are important in the world exist at the scale of a metropolitan area. The mega region is um, the scale that would include you know, Wollongong, Sydney, Newcastle, maybe Canberra, probably not. Um, uh, and that's a newer concept, a lot of discussion about it. It is very imprecisely defined right now, which makes sense because it's still a new concept. Um, I think of that as the scale of distance that supports um, occasional commuting. Um, not something people would mostly do five days a week, but they might do one or two or three days a week. That kind of is the outer boundaries of what defines the mega region. And, um, and there's, so it, in a sense, it's an expanded version of the labor market. It's, a, it's like a labor market plus. Um, and um, there's a lot of reasons to think that there might be um, economic and environmental benefits to tying the mega region together um, through rail, which maybe is more the second half of the paper. But what I'm really trying to do here is, say, is ask the question, what are we trying to do at this Sydney to Melbourne scale? And I'm going to basically, I'm coining a new term here, super region, which to me is, um, it's the area where you might fly for a meeting and come back and sleep in your own house. That's what defines it today. And it is analogous to, um, I think, uh, the East Coast and the West Coast of the United States where you don't really go, you don't really commute every day, but, but it's heavy zone of commuter flights. Um, it's also where there is the emergence of a common economic culture. The West Coast is, is the zone of tech culture in America. During your career, you would take a job in LA and then Seattle and then San Francisco. Um, you probably would even go to parties if you're in that fancy set. Um, you certainly have friends and uh, you're certainly going to hire people. You're sort of, there's a density of interaction across this geography. Um, when we had Richard Florida, the economic geographer based in Toronto, give his talk to the committee a few months ago, his biggest advice was, he said, um, Sydney and Melbourne need to collaborate to compete, meaning the scale, get, getting to cr critical mass in order to attract global talent, you need, people need to believe that their job options encompass both cities. Um, they need to think they're moving to a zone that includes both cities. So I think 
that is the start of some theory behind why it might be worth it economically to tie Sydney and Melbourne together um, uh, more than they are today. In the end, I can't quite say it's worth doing, partly because of the cost, partly because there's so many other things to do, partly because this hinges on a lot of speculation about future technology in aviation and in rail, frankly. Um, I conclude that the next step should be Sydney to Canberra. Uh, because that project makes a lot of sense on its own merits. Uh, it's a huge project still, but it makes sense on its own merits. And it sets up the next generation to keep going, if that makes sense. So I say, let's get started. Turning briefly to the second half of the report, um, uh, what Marion calls rail renovations, um, what is more commonly referred to in, in the Sydney political discussion as faster rail. Um, this is a little diagram from the Committee for Sydney's Sandstone Mega Region Report, where we just, we looked at a very simple, um, assuming 200 kilometers per hour, what would trip time be between these different parts? Um, we really think that um, these linkages make sense. Um, the part of it is that um, uh, Western Sydney is going to be 50 degrees under climate change. It might turn out to make sense that a lot of people decide they want to live in Newcastle or Wollongong, closer to the coast. It might be that a fast rail connection facilitates those cities to become one or two million population centers uh, in their own right. Um, I don't get hung up on whether that's going to lead to um, more people living in Newcastle and commuting to Sydney or vice versa. Although certainly I think to begin with, it would be people living in, in Newcastle, but in the long run, does that lead to jobs following the talent to Newcastle? Maybe. I think that stuff is very hard to predict, but it certainly ties together um, the metropolitan economy, expands the footprint or the, the effective reach of the labor market. And it, it makes sense if it's tied to a much bigger vision about um, a reorganization of settlement patterns, where you're really thinking that Newcastle and Wollongong could grow mu much more than they are currently planned to. I think that's, that's what makes this make sense. Um, so this, of course, is um, a beautiful picture of Newcastle. Um, to sort of bring this full circle to my thesis, um, the reason to do these things is a lot about land use. This is a building being built above the Pitt Street Metro station. Um, uh, fast rail, rail renovations, high-speed rail, increase the utility of the overall network. Um, they are places where it's logical to go really big in proportion to the, the level of connectivity they provide. There is, an experience that happens a lot with infrastructure where um, uh, in the beginning, uh, people can't quite figure out how to use it. Mayor Bloomberg, at great political cost, built a bunch of bike lanes that no one used. Um, and then 10 years later, all of a sudden, it got to network. It got to be there was a network effect, and you started to see people riding, riding bikes in New York, a quite shocking turn of events. Um, the, the train I rode uh, uh, every day for years was called BART, the Bay Area Rapid Transit System, um, written up by the great uh, theorist and historian of city planning, Peter Hall, in Great Planning Disasters, as it has a whole chapter on the failure of BART, because four years after it opened, its daily ridership was a tiny fraction of what was promised. However, the numbers I could find right before COVID were it was um, daily riders vastly exceeded those projected um, by its planners. This is not to say that every piece of infrastructure turns out to be a success. It is rather to say that we have to be humble about, our, uh, about how future generations will use the infrastructure they inherit from us. Um, the uh, final slide I will show is a reminder of the Harbor Bridge, which would never have made sense or as they say in Australia, stacked up uh, according to 
the way business cases are done. Um, but it has gone on to be an important project. Um, I'll close there and look forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Gabriel. And, um, you know, first up, I really love what you've done with the cover of our report. Um, <laughs> and also, I have to say that as a former Penrith girl, the idea of moving to Newcastle is a little terrifying for the sheer fact that you'd have to support the Newcastle Knights and not the Penrith Panthers. But um, I have to I, think about that. Yeah, I think, I think it's, you know, critical to your thinking there. Um, first up, I kind of wanted to turn to Marion because I think um, you've had a little bit of criticism in terms of um, the report that you put out, Fast Train Fever, and um, there was a recent article in The Conversation by Marcus Spiller claiming that your report didn't take into account the city shaping impact of high-speed rail, which is something that um, Gabrielle's been touching on a little bit here. What's your take on this? Sorry, uh, Marion, you're, you're, you're on muted. Mute. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, it so it very much goes to Gabriel's point about um, what this, what big projects like bullet trains or even really um, much significantly improved regional rail links can do for land use patterns and settlement patterns. So, um, so Marcus Spiller um, wrote an article in the Conversation last week where he argued that our report and, and by implication, the feasibility study on the bullet train neglects a series of benefits. So these neglected benefits are those that are concerned with shaping cities and regions. And he's talking about both cities and regions, I think. And, and he's right in that we didn't include them in our report and the feasibility study didn't include them either. So just by way of background, for those who are not steeped in train culture, um, it, the feasibility study was commissioned by the Commonwealth when Labor was last in office and it was published in 2013. It's the study that came up with the, um, the route that I showed on a slide earlier of Melbourne to Brisbane. The feasibility study, which was using normal Australian practice, found that almost all the benefits of a bullet train would go to individual travellers, in mainly in the form of quicker trips. Um, and the study did acknowledge that high-speed rail can contribute to regional development and can offer benefits to cities. Um, it did emphasize you'd need a raft of other policies to get those regional development benefits or the city benefits. Um, and the authors of the feasibility study said that um, the be these benefits were too uncertain to include in the context of this proposal. So the question of these broader benefits is a bit of a fraught one. Um, Marcus Spiller is certainly not alone in arguing that these benefits exist and that they're large. Um, so the, I guess what I'd say about this is, um, in my research on this question, what I've found is that much of the economic activity that might arise around a big new piece of infrastructure is not necessarily new activity. It's, some of it, and it could be big, is transferred from somewhere else. For example, with the French high-speed rail system, um, when the network was built, it did bring benefits to the smaller cities like Lille and Lyon, um, but these benefits were not as big as the benefits that went to Paris. And the headquarters of the railway company, for example, shifted from Lyon to Paris. It, and the benefits that did go to places like Lille and Lyon uh, came at the expense of smaller surrounding towns. In other words, a lot of the change was a transfer from one location to another, not a new benefit, a shifted benefit. So that's one point I'd make about this. Um, and my second point is related, really, that some of the changes that would arise from a new bullet train could indeed be city shaping and region shaping and could change settlement patterns. And some of it could be transferring from one place to another. And some of it can be wider costs, and we, we need to think about costs, wider costs as well, which are also not quantified. And the kind of thing I'm thinking about here is if the railway line cut a community in half or spoilt the livability of an area or the, things like that. We, we can't assume that city shaping and region shaping are always favourable. They're clearly not. In the end, I have found nothing convincing enough to warrant me arguing that we should stump up $130 billion of public funds for benefits that are highly uncertain. 
I think don't forget someone's got to pay for this. The rea reality is it's taxpayers around the country, not just the business travellers between capital cities who would be the primary winners from this proposal. Thanks, Marion. And I think I remember one of the striking um, details from your report was how much each individual taxpayer would essentially have to pay in order to build this for an, uh, an East Coast audience, um, especially East Coast business audience. Um, and it's quite a significant amount of money. Um, sorry, were you going to say something? I, I could just expand. I, I want to um, give Gabriel a chance to comment on that. But if I could just stay, say one thing about that. Um, I, I said at the start of this session, I love a, a fast train trip as much as anyone. But I have to admit, when I was travelling on the TV in France, although it was a pleasure, it was a bit of a guilty pleasure. And that's because, you know, for me, when I'm travelling on that train, the benefits that I get as a traveller are very high. It's very heavily subsidised. So I'm not really paying my way. So, of course, the benefits to me outweigh the costs. But it's very different to the question of whether the benefits to, the, to French society outweigh the costs to French society and whether the benefits to the French taxpayer outweigh the costs. The, so the, the, the uh, figure that you were referring to is that it would take a tax hike of about $10,000 for every personal taxpayer in Australia to fund the bullet train. And, and I, I suppose I think, well, if you're in WA or if you're in Tasmania, you might be a bit disgruntled when you realise that the main beneficiaries would be business travellers between Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane. And, you, and also, if you think about um, people who might never ride the train, if they think about what other infrastructure projects could have been built if the bullet train had not gone ahead. So I can't help but, <clears throat> but be concerned about the equity and fairness implications of asking taxpayers of all stripes to fund what largely amounts to faster trips for business travellers. Now, Gabriel, um, you've talked a little bit about, uh, you know, changing land use patterns um, through using uh, re regional rail. And I was just wondering if you had anything to add to that kind of uh, counter argument yeah. there. Yeah, I mean, I'm very sympathetic to it, and which is why I, I get myself to an ambivalent place on this question. I will say that... Um, um, some of this hinges on, on some question about economic externalities. Um, the, the comparison case is what are the costs of not building high-speed rail? So we're going to continue to rely on the automobile and uh, aviation. Um, we're going to continue to spend money um, expanding motorways. We're going to continue to bear the costs of the pollution of continued driving. Um, the um, embodied energy that goes into building all of those cars and all of those airplanes. Um, and to really do the maths on that, right, we'd have to have, um, we'd have to internalize the, ca the costs of um, all that pollution. Um, there is a giant literature on, uh, devoted to answering the question, what is the true cost of uh, driving a kilometer? Um, if, it, if it internalized all the externalities and an enormous range of numbers that have uh, been proposed from you know, peer reviewed economics articles. But um, my own view is that the, the, the prices are really, really wrong today. And that the, the true subsidy to driving dwarfs the official counted subsidy to driving that we use today. So um, I think the really doing a good job comparing, um, yes, it would be expensive to build and operate high-speed rail, but it's also very expensive to um, expand and operate uh, what we're doing today. I don't know in a really fair comparison, I really don't know which would come out as being more expensive. Yeah, and that's a really good point. And especially at the moment where a lot of us aren't commuting or aren't traveling at the moment, um, you know, especially we're, we're in Melbourne, Marion and myself, and um, we're, we're at home in lockdown. Um, and that leads me to a really um, a question that keeps coming up um, both in our online Q&A, but also in the pre-prepared questions, which is how is COVID-19 changing the way we commute? And I think 
you know, the first question I have for you on this particular topic is, should we actually be funding infrastructure projects at the moment? What should we be funding um, given that um, the work from home situation is changing the way we commute? Is that, that Marian? Well for me? <laughs> Do you want to have a go on that one, Gabriel? Yeah, yeah sure. Um, okay, Kat, this is, right, this is the question we're all debating. Um, and of course, the real and the only possible correct answer is it's too soon to tell, but we're all going to speculate anyway, because that's our job and it's fun. <laughs> um, yeah, look, I think, um, I think uh, if you're lucky enough to have an office job, uh, and if you're lucky enough to still have that job, you have probably come to the realization that working from home is either pretty great or at least not that bad. Um, that's certainly what most people seem to be saying. I, I definitely think there is going to be a greater cultural acceptance. Um, and uh, you know, the conventional wisdom seems to be that most companies will move to um, a hybrid model I think unpacking what exactly the nature of that hybrid model will be is quite important um, in terms of thinking about how this change in working patterns and corporate culture is going to translate into changes in metropolitan form and settlement pattern. Um, but it does seem quite, it's a bit contradictory um, in terms of our discussion today. Um, people may be more likely to live further away um, but only some of those choices would actually suggest um, upgraded rail as an enabler. Um, if I'm going to keep my job in Sydney and move to Newcastle, rail would really help me. But if I'm going to keep my job in Sydney and move to Bali um, because I'd really have been untethered and I can be anywhere, then, then rail, of course, is irrelevant. Um, the countervailing force, however, is... Um, yeah, if, if, uh, if the technology of remote communications and collaboration gets vastly better, um, there could be an acceleration of all of this in a, in a way that's, that's far beyond the Zoom meetings. And so the Silicon Valley is busy coming up with the next set of, um, of tools to enable this. Um, and so the next time a pandemic hits, um, uh, or some other reason um, to to enable remote working, presumably the tools will be a lot better, and that will be that will continue to to evolve. So I still end up believing that um, you know I'd place my bet on the great cities of the world retaining their magnetic pull, um, even if the purpose evolves a bit, even if it becomes more of a lifestyle choice um, rather than an economic imperative. Um, I think the great cities of the world will, will continue to, to thrive and attract people and grow and that um, transport infrastructure that enables the great cities to, to interact with each other and the great neighborhoods to interact with each other um, is going to be in high demand. That's where I'd put my bet. Marion, do you have anything to add to that? Um, yeah, I um, it, it is interesting, isn't it? I think before the pandemic, working from home was a real minority activity. About 5% of people in Sydney, Melbourne and Brisbane were working from home. Uh, the trend was heading up, but it's off this tiny base. I think the, the numbers that I've seen about the proportion of jobs that can be done from home is about 40% in Australia. So that is quite a lot, but it's a large minority of jobs. Um, and, and, and for now we can do it. Um, I, I think it's true. I think some people, as you said, Gabriel, love the flexibility, the absence of distractions, the time saved from not having to commute more time with kids. But there are also people who hate the isolation, the difficulty of forming new relationships without ever meeting, the lack of boundaries between work and home, the time with kids, whatever. So there's sort of a thing about different temperaments, different jobs, different seasons of life that I think 
are important. I, I do think we're pretty social creatures. And I've got to say, I'd prefer to be doing this event in person and to be able to interact more directly with the, with the audience and with you. Um, but we can do this and, and we are finding that and you know we're learning about how to do it better. So I, I think um, it's really hard to know what this is going to mean for travel in the future. This is just a time of very high uncertainty. So I totally agree with Gabriel at this point that cities do have a magnetic pull, but it doesn't mean we have to do things the way we used to do them before. Absolutely not. Yeah, it's just um, changing so quickly. And I think it's definitely one where we'll have to watch this space. Um, now, we've had uh, a question on um, on the Q&A about discount rates, your favourite topic, Marion. And I think this ties in nicely to a question I had been thinking about in light of COVID-19 is how do you determine which projects are worth the investment? Um, and maybe you can touch a little bit on how we're evaluating them at the moment. Yeah, so um, this is a, a slightly arcane topic, um, but it, it's really important. So um, thank you to the person who asked the question. Um, what the discount rate, just by way of context, is the um, it's the device that we use to um, value costs and benefits that occur in the future on a um, a similar on an equivalent time basis, um, and. And so when people think we should be forging ahead and uh, getting upstream of demand and building a legacy for future generations, um, they've got this counter argument is that there's these needs we've got today that we should be meeting and we should focus on them. Um, so we use the discount rate to help us to compare, for example, high speed rail, where no one will ride the train for, for 26 years after you decide to start building and the whole line won't be finished for 50 years compared to a regional rail upgrade that will give people a faster trip in a, in a few years time um, or anything else for that matter. So uh, my argument is we don't do this well in this country at all. The discount rate that is used to assess transport projects is 7% and it's been stuck at that level for over 30 years. And, and this is a problem because one of the key factors driving the discount rate is the cost of borrowing that the government incurs. And over 30 years, that's shrunk. It, like it's just dropped like a stone. It was um, 30 years ago, it was 6.8% in real terms. And now it's approximately zero or even below zero. So the implication of this is that we judge far too harshly those projects and rail projects are often in this category where the benefits won't be seen for a long time. And we give too much priority or we, we assess fav too favorably in a relative sense those where the benefits occur in the nearer term. So it's a, that's a bit of a long answer, but I, th I think it's um, important uh, and, um, in thinking about, when you do think about something like a bullet train, um, one of the things in the high-speed rail, in the feasibility study was they used a discount rate of 4%, which wouldn't be accepted by Infrastructure Australia at present. But um, it, it, in a lot of ways, it's a more legitimate number but the, there is a bit of an issue in that there's a penalty that applies um, to all projects and so um, it affects the ranking if some of them get to not have the penalty apply and others don't so um, I'd like I definitely like to see better and more realistic use of discount rates and it, um, I think it would um, have an impact on this kind of discussion about the relative merits of this versus that. Thanks, Marion. Gabrielle, I've got a good question for you, which is uh, from Todd on our Q&A, and it's um, what about improved suburban rail services? And I think it might be good to hear your thoughts on how um, they potentially could be improved to um, enhance our connectivity and, you know, the economic growth in regional areas and, and that. Yeah, yeah, well, it's absolutely essential. And um, uh, the... There's a lot happening in Sydney and in Melbourne on that right now um, that I think is um, quite exciting. Um, compared to where I come from, where, um, yeah, it, 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 it's, I, I've never seen a kind of metropolitan rail building boom look anything like, uh, like what's happening here. And, and it's quite wonderful which isn't to say that when I put my advocate hat on, I'm 
I'm in there saying it's not nearly enough and there should be much more. And I have a list of projects, um, a long list of projects that um, we think make sense. We think government should be taking advantage of the low interest rates to borrow money, to build more. Um, uh, I will put in a little asterisk on it that um, it all makes even more sense if it is accompanied by land use changes. Um, I'll put a second asterisk on, which is that it would make even more sense if it was accompanied by stopping um, motorway expansion. Um, uh, the, there, there's this sort of stage that certainly is, is where New South Wales is at, which is build everything, expand, expand infrastructure for cars, expand it for trains, and in the end, it's a bit incoherent um, because, uh, yeah, it's it's not gonna it's not gonna move the Sydney in a direction that is uh, um, more sustainable, but um, it's going to it's going to certainly um, help to just keep up with basic population growth. So, following on from that, um, what's your top ticket um, suburban? transport item or train item for Sydney? Well, we're the, the, the first one that is probably at the top of our list is what's called West Metro, which is supposedly underway, except we, we don't see the, we don't see the tradies out there working on it yet. And, and, and it's actually a bit hard to pin down. Is it really underway? Um, but that is um, from Sydney to Parramatta, um, uh, 20 or 25 minutes. Um, when it's completed with a bunch of stops along the way, providing rail access um, uh, to, to places that currently cannot walk to a rail stop. Um, it will be a driverless metro train. And the plan is to then keep going um, out to the new airport. There's essentially gonna be an outer orbital um, uh, metro ring for Sydney with a lot of crisscrossing lines and eventually it needs to get to be more of a grid, like you would see in a place, a, a mature public transport city like London or Paris or Tokyo, where you can really get from everywhere to everywhere. Um, I mean, that's the dream. Oh, look, we've got a dream. I think it's it's good to be optimistic. Um, I've got a really good question here from Owen on the Q&A for Marion. Um, what do you think of the business case for Sydney to Canberra uh, bullet train, I'm assuming? And uh, the second part of that question is, uh, do you agree that the original business case for the Sydney Harbour Bridge wouldn't stack up if it was drafted <laughs> today? Would you build it, Marion? <laughs> um, I think I know who Owen is. Um, uh, yeah, so Sydney to Canberra, um, so what it's got is it's got, um, even though Canberra is a small centre, it's got a probably um, unusual level of uh, train, uh, sorry, plane travel into Canberra and it, particularly via Sydney or from Sydney directly. So you would think that that would be a pretty favourable place to start. And I, I understand that the New South Wales and, and ACT government are deep in discussions about this, um, although how fast it will be, I don't know. Um, so uh, I guess the, um, so, so I, I sort of always struggle a bit to, um, to, come up with what the business case would say on the hoof because I don't really know but um, you can see why that would look pretty promising um, because there is this guaranteed travel in and out of Canberra that even in the face of these COVID restrictions politicians are um, federal politicians are feeling the need to meet physically I heard Tony Burke on the radio the other day saying you just can't really do business um, by Zoom it's very important to to be in the room and to to do this together so um, you can imagine this is a pretty persistent trend, um, but uh, in the end, you want um, the comp you want the volumes, and I think that that I'm probably with Gabriel that the the most viable component of the route is Sydney to Melbourne. Um, so that's that one. Um, on the what was the second half of the question, Kat? Harbour Bridge. It's uh, does the oh, Harbour Bridge? I'm sure I forgot that on purpose. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Um, with so we love the Harbour Bridge. It's absolutely iconic. Um, we we don't have the counterfactual. Um, so we we Sydney would have grown in a very different way if you didn't have that 
means of getting um, between North and South. It would be just an utterly different place. And, and this is kind of the thing, like it is very hard with these land use and settlement changing proposals or, or, or pieces of infrastructure like the Harbour Bridge. It's very difficult to either foresee the future or foresee a different future that would have occurred if we'd have had something that wasn't the Harbour Bridge or had nothing at all. So um, there's sort of two parts to this question, really. I think the 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 kind of um, the one that we 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 have our emotional reactions to things like bullet trains and the Harbour Bridge um, because they have this a particular kind of appeal. But but I think we are also in the world of thinking about what would be the different settlement patterns, what would be the different land use planning and planning um, outcomes. And, and that I just find um, very hard to say. All I will say is now we've got it, it is great. I, I know that you will laugh at me for saying that, but that's the truth of it. When, when you do build these things, people will use them. It's really just what is the opportunity cost of doing that? What else could you have had that would have been perhaps even better? Look, I think, Marion, uh, that's a good place for us to wrap up. I've, I've, you're leaving me with visions of what could have been. Could we have had the world-famous Parramatta River Bridge um, connecting north and south? And um, I'm following on from Ga some of Gabrielle's research, um, potentially moving the centre of the city to um, Parramatta rather than um, the Sydney CBD. Um, I'd just like to spend some time uh, just thanking everyone for coming and especially thank you to our partners, uh, the National Library of Australia for their support in organising this event and to the Grattan team as well behind the scenes. Um, you probably don't see the people who put a lot of work into these events, but we'd like to especially thank our events coordinator and tech behind the scenes today, Beatrice Ringrose. I'd like to say before you go that Grattan Institute is a nonprofit organisation and we do rely on donations from wonderful people like you. If you've valued our research and webinars this year, we'd love it if you could donate at grattan.edu.au forward slash donate. We'd really appreciate it. So to you, all our viewers, thank you so much for joining us today. Please take care, wear your masks, wash your hands, and thanks so much for watching. Thank you. Thank you.